Hello, and welcome to my presentation about mechanical behavior of biomedical materials. These materials is still kind of a novelty within the framework of the European conferences of fracture. Usually, it covers rather more traditional engineering materials. I hope that this invited lecture will provide you with an opportunity to understand more about these materials, the state of the art, and the ways how to deal with them in very different practical applications. Before presentation, as always, I would like to acknowledge contribution of researchers to this presentation. Most of the work was performed by researchers from my Mechanics of Advanced Materials Research Group at Loughborough University, with contribution from the team by Professor Bjorn Busse in Germany, Dr. Justin Fernandez from the University of Auckland in New Zealand, as well as the group of Dr. Sergei Besikov in Minsk in Belarus. I would also like to draw your attention to activities of the Technical Committee 14 of the European Structural Integrity Society, Integrity of Biomedical and Biological Materials. This Technical Committee covers a broad range of topics in the area of biological and biomedical materials, and everybody is welcome to participate in its activities. Another announcement. There is a special issue on damage and fracture of biological materials of the Journal of Mechanical Behavior of Biomedical Materials published by Elsevier. Here is the most important dates for its submission, and you are welcome to contribute to this special issue. Before going to the main body of the presentation, I would like to draw your attention to some publications by my group in this area. Now let's go to the motivation. Clearly, there is a significant difference between the biological materials and engineering materials. One of the major difference is a huge diversity in their properties. Starting with the Young's modulus or comparable parameters of stiffness, they can change within the body from kilopascals to gigapascals. Another important point is the effect of environment. Different tissues dif behave differently whether they are exposed to the conditions in air or in the water, or in the physiological conditions where they are mainly functioning. So that's why this is one of the challenges presented by these materials. In many cases, the tests performed with the standard equipment do not produce the results that are characteristics of their, so to say, in-service performance. So these topics will be covered in this presentation. Let's start with the bone, and this is also a historical avenue which I was using personally in this type of research. The logic behind the bone that this is a multi-scale hierarchical structure which comprises different main components. One of the most important one in the cortical bone are osteons. Those who are familiar with composites can consider that this is like a fibers which are spread along the lens of the bone. Interestingly enough, usually we use the fibers to reinforce materials. Here, and this is the nature that created us in this way, the osteons are rather weakening parts, but as a result, they are effectively support not only the load-bearing capacity necessary for the bones, but also prevent their fractures, which is even more important. Another important part, and this is typical for all biological materials, is that they are not as in the given state. They develop, they grow, and this process of growth is 
known as remodeling. It can be beneficial. On the other hand, in some cases, which we'll discuss later on, the new unnecessary growth of the bone and ossification, especially heterotropic ossification, can be a rather painful experience for people, for instance, like amputees. Another typical example of the biological tissue is the skeletal muscle. You can also see its complex hierarchical structure. Also, it is sub supported by the bone by attachment with a tendon made of collagen. These materials will also be covered in this presentation. Let's go to the bone. Generally, bones are complex microstructured materials with an isotropic elastoviscoplastic behavior which differs in tension and compression. Importantly, as all the biomaterials, they demonstrate a significant spread in their properties, even for the same bone, not to speak about different patients under different conditions. A large spread in their post-critical behavior is due to significant differences in the progressive damage mechanisms, which depends on the orientation of the load with regard to the orientation of the fibers and can result in different types of the unloading curves. And once more, I would like to highlight the difference between the compression and tension behavior of these materials. These different damage mechanisms have different realization in specimens taken from different parts of the same femoral bone as presented here. We will be using a standard notation. A stands for anterior, P for posterior, M for medial, and L for lateral. You can see here the position of the osteons and interstitial matrix. This is another constituent of the bone that separates osteon from other osteons in the bone. These tests demonstrated that depending on the orientation of the crack propagation with regard to the osteons, totally different fracture scenarios can be found in the material, including interfacial debonding, fiber debonding, and others. All these type of the mechanisms were found in our numerical multi-scale models, where we were embedding the microstructured domain into the material with effective homogenized properties, exposed to the three-point bending, as in a real test. Three different formulations for the model were used. One was of the effective homogeneous media. Another was for the three-page composite, which accounted for the osteons, interstitial matrix, and the Havesian canals, which are effectively, in mechanical terms, the empty voids in this case. The four-phase composite material also included direct introduction of the so-called cement line. This is a layer with a thickness of two to five microns, which surrounds the Austrian material. This model allowed us to describe the main mechanisms of the fracture growth at the microscale level, including such mechanisms as crack deflection, twisting and kinking of the crack, as well as interfacial debonding. Speaking about the experimental part, we have also for the first time calculated the critical value of J integral for four different positions inside the same femoral bone. You can see here that there is a significant difference and clearly that 
evolution designed us in the best way so that we should consider what are the reasons for this specific type with regard to the biomechanics of bones in movement. The simulations were performed for both quasi-static uniaxial tensor loading as well for the dynamic loading. The next step of our research was to look in the effect of different features on the fracture in human bones. And here we were considering four groups of patients, young, senior, diseased, and treated. At the first stage, we were looking at the macrostructure and distribution of its main constituents. And even from these data, you can immediately see a significant difference, say, between the young and senior groups in terms of porosity. And people who are dealing with porous materials would immediately understand the disadvantage of the senior group in these terms. The fraction of osteons is significantly larger in young people and in the seniors. And there are some differences in both diseased materials and people who were treated with different medications. This is reflected also in the properties of the osteons in each of the group. In order to incorporate these features into the models, instead of the direct remission of the scanned images, we rather preferred to do the statistical analysis looking at different type of statistics for different constituents. And as a result, we introduced four types of the representative volume elements for each of these four groups. This provided us with the opportunity to have different statistical realization for the same set of parameters inside each group. You can immediately see some differences most pronounced for the young as compared to the senior groups. This is a description of our model. We were incorporating this representative volume into the model using the cohesive zone elements with the zero thickness. As a result, you can see that the crack propagation in different groups is totally different. One of the most important features is the of the cement lines, which are attracting the crack and deflecting them from the percolation of the osteons, as in the case of the senior group. If to look at the typical fracture toughness analysis, what you can see that the young group outperforms all the other groups where the difference between the groups is relatively small. This can have a direct practical consequences. In parallel with simulations, we were performing also a non-indentation analysis into the human femur. And we were considering the differences in the properties for these four different parts of the bone. This was a foundation for our further study regarding the ultimate load which a human femur can carry after a surgical resection. People who have bone of cancer the only way to treat them is to remove a significant amount of the bone. You can see here a typical type, which can be up to 270 degrees removal and with the length of several centimeters. And the doctors, they always have a problem about the residual load bearing capacity in this case. They don't know how they should treat, whether the patient should be in bed or whether they should be allowed to walk or whether they can be just doing something without this type of 
restriction. The next step would be for us to consider the importance of the two major factors. The first one is related to a position of the resected area inside the bone. I already shown you that in different parts of the cortical bone, the properties in terms of its fracture toughness are different. Clearly, you are supposed to deal with the position as it is related to a disease. But the major message here is that if it is in different parts, the residual load bearing capacity, even for the same scale of removal of the bone, can be significantly different. Another part is that in many cases, in order to remove the part of the bone, the surgeons, they have an overcut in the area of removal. So this can significant consequences, as you can imagine, on the crack growth or fracture. As discussed, bones are growing, the process known as remodeling. For many cases related to fracture or surgical operations, this process is relatively unimportant because the characteristic period of bone growth is relatively long. But for the healing process or for long-term performance, it is an important matter. Bone growth is described by the so-called Wolf's Law, which effectively states that the mechanical stimuli play the most important part in the bone growth process. To study the effect of the bone growth, we performed a series of tests looking at the long-term effect of mechanical stimuli on the growth of trabecular bone. People were exercising on a controlled leg, say, and they were then exposed to high-resolution computer tomography scans, which provided the details about the tiniest changes in the position and characteristics of the constituents of the trabecular bone. We have also developed an algorithm which allows us to predict this type of behavior for different types of mechanical stimuli. And I would like to draw your attention to a presentation by Dr. Joan Du, who will be speaking about this. Now let's move to prosthesis. The current state of prosthetics does not change significantly from the previous centuries, though some materials which have been used for them clearly are becoming more modern. Still, it is more of an art than of science because not many quantitative models which allows to predict performance of this very complex system exist. We have performed a significant analysis in this area. One of the major challenges is the transition between the hard tissue bone, which is enveloped by a soft tissue, a muscle, which is also in the contact with prosthesis, which is made in nowadays from such materials as carbon fiber reinforced plastics. These are the major elements of methodology. Clearly, we should start with the idea about the shape of the major constituents and then to go to the model. The model would incorporate different formulation for different type of materials and clearly have all the elements from scanning to meshing in one system our model and this is a typical type of the model you can see here the domain of the bone which is 
embedded into the domain of the soft tissues. And there is also a liner which separates the limb from the prosthesis. These are the major elements presented here. As discussed, different material models should be used for specific constituents. Bone can be modeled for these purposes in a more simple way because of its significantly higher stiffness. Liner, which is predominantly made of a soft materials, is described with a hyperelastic material. Similar models are being used to discuss the soft tissue the muscle. As a result, you can see here a distribution of the pressure in different parts of the limb. One of the important challenges in this type of approach is parameter identification. The properties of the tissues, unfortunately, can be easily obtained. Even if we will take some specimens from the corpses, their properties would be different from those of live humans. To overcome this problem, we have developed an approach which allows us to quantify the properties of the soft tissues by using an identification mechanism and supporting finite element simulations where using inverse analysis, we can quantify some of the material properties. Another important problem, which I've mentioned, is of the unnecessary bone growth. If a person has already suffered a surgical operation resulting in removal of part of their limb, there is still a possibility that at the edge of the bone, there can be a spike-like ingrowth of bones, which can cause suffering of the patient. To avoid this, people can use what is known as intramedullary implants. In many cases, it was made of metals, which are significantly stiffer even than the bone. In the ideal case, we would like to have clearly this implant with a gradient of its properties from those of a rigid body to that of a significantly softer surrounding muscles. One opportunity for this is to use a 3D printed composite materials. Here we demonstrated to you the possibility to create some 3D printed structures with this microstructure made of a pure PDMS as well as with different extents of re reinforcement with peak particles. In this case, we can also to change peak content as well as the spatial infill allowing to produce functionally graded composites with the properties changing in a very significant range. We have also demonstrated a possibility of transition of the properties practically in the material which has several layers without significant interfacial areas between the layers. Let us now move to another type of the application of the knowledge into the biotissues. This is called negative pressure wound therapy of the wounds. Here are the typical situation of the wounds which people are getting, for instance, in battlefields. The benefits of this therapy are the significant speed up of the healing growth. The general idea is a straightforward one that 
the wound is being covered by a drape and the vacuum source is causing the negative pressure in the bone. As a result, it affects the supply of the oxygen to the tissues which controls the healing process. The problem with this is that there are not many studies into this process and the doctors they don't know the effect of the different types of the wounds on the performance. And here we have once more the situation, the limb, the part of the bone embedded into the soft tissue and we have a wound. And wounds clearly can be of different shapes and different dimensions. In order to understand how to heal them, the only way is to go through the modeling process. And here are the results, for instance, for a given type of a wound exposed to different level of the pressures up to the limit of a pain. In order to validate and verify this approach, some tests were performed with materials with the properties similar to those of the wound tissues and employing the digital image correlation. You can see here the experiment and you can see here the supporting finite element simulations which allowed us to assess the process. Rather, I would move to the next topic of the materials which are biological but which have a potential to be used for biomedical applications. Hydrogel and collagen. The hydrogel material is an interesting one. It is not only that it is being produced by bacteria forming a nano fiber network. The most important part of this material that it contains 99% of the water. So you can imagine yourself that this is a composite with nanofibers, but instead of any polymetric matrix, it has water. Clearly, this would affect its performance in significant way. This is a hierarchical structure of these hydrogels. You can see here that it starts at the level of the nanometers going all the way to the macro scale and you can see that the wet specimen here has features not dissimilar from the polymers still to remind you it doesn't have a polymeric matrix but a water one from 98 to 99 and more percent of the water content. As a result of such a complex microstructure, hydrogels present a rather complex deformational mechanical behavior as shown in this slide for their test in water. Importantly, there are some underpinning mechanisms at the nanoscale which, which affects this type of materials behavior. It is related to the changes in the intersection between the nanofibers forming denser or sparser microstructure resulting in different responses of materials. Clearly, water also plays an important part. If we are squeezing this material or stretching them, the water will start moving inside this nanofibrous matrix as a result causing a complex time-dependent behavior. If we will use a typical creep analysis at different levels of the stresses, you can see that the responses, though qualitatively similar, they change quantitatively and the reason for this 
is the extent of the changes in the fibrous structure of the material, which generally can also be controlled in order to accommodate the requested performance of the materials. Another material which is very important and prominent in our body is collagen. It forms one third of all the proteins in our body. We have produced the 100% collagen films in order to study its properties rather than use the live tissues, which would be a mixture of different constituents. Here, we also considered the difference of the environment. We performed the test on dry specimens, hydrated materials, and fully imaged material into a water bath at different temperatures. And here is a very important point about the effect of the environment. Dry materials, they are significantly stiffer by orders of magnitude compared to their wet ones. So here the insert shows the level of the strength. Importantly, the ductility is changing dramatically as well. Dry materials, they performed nearly a brittle behavior, while the materials exposed to the fluid, they demonstrate a much softer behavior, but with the level of the strains at failure, which exceeds that for the dry specimens significantly. As a result, we see that these materials, they demonstrate a ductile failure. This is a kind of a teaser for the presentation by Shirsha Bose, which will be dealing with the specificity of fracture in this type of materials. Here I would like to stop my lecture. I hope that multiple examples which were presented here will demonstrate you the current state of the art and challenges in the area of mechanics of biological and biomedical materials. I hope also that this will attract new researchers into this very interesting and important area. Thank you very much for your attention.